We live now in an era defined by the amplification of our actions. Everything we do is spiraled into scales of time and space beyond our individual human perception. In this moment, we are uniquely able to create vast impacts with even our smallest gestures. It is an unforgiving era that realizes the uncanny unlikelihood that our unfolding of saran wrap made from fossil fuels might be linked to the melting of the Larsen Sea iceberg or unprecedented wildfires in Australia. How are we to reconcile gestures necessitated by our existence with the destruction our species has wrought? How can we learn to live, to dwell within a climate crisis? My name is Ali Wist and I'm here to present a project and a body of research called Dwelling in a Climate Crisis. This work is a philosophically inspired argument about what dwelling means in the Anthropocene as cited within lived domestic experiences suggests artistic and embodied interventions that can help us understand the challenges we face. The images and projects took place at a residency in upstate New York in a futuristic dome dwelling called the Shell House. During my time there, I looked at Martin Heidegger's writing on dwelling and brought it to projects in and around the property. So let's start with the term dwelling, which comes from the philosopher Martin Heidegger and two lectures he gave in 1951. He asked, what does dwelling on earth mean and how can we do it poetically? Or put another way, what is the nature of our existence on earth and can it be done authentically? His questions were piqued by housing shortages in Germany and post-World War II destruction, casting real challenges upon the physical act of dwelling in Europe at the time. But this became a larger and more existential question. Heidegger reframes dwelling not just as building or as housing, but as an existential act of existing on and occupying Earth as a mortal, an act from which building and housing extend, but one that is more elusive. The real plight of dwelling, he acknowledged, is indeed older than the world wars with their destruction, older also than the increase in the Earth's population and industrial pollution. The real dwelling plight lies in this, that mortals ever search anew for the nature of dwelling, and they must ever learn to dwell. A kind of poetic dwelling would strengthen us on Earth, and this Earth in particular. Viewed through a contemporary lens, we can read this as a call to reconcile our means of sustaining mankind by living and consuming resources with the nature of an existence that depends on this Earth. These questions he posed over 50 years ago rang familiar to me. Is all dwelling, especially amid the sixth mass extinction and climate crisis, destructive? Does our very act of existing on Earth with all the ecological impacts our species have wrought remain incompatible with a poetic or sustainable way of being? Heidegger's search for authenticity certainly shares an echo with contemporary challenges, and so his inquiry is posed to us still. How might we learn to dwell poetically on Earth at a time when even direct knowledge of ecological destruction is veiled from us in obtuse and pernicious ways? First, we must acknowledge what living in the Anthropocene entails, living in a time when the extrapolated ramifications of the building of civilizations and modernity has been revealed in grotesque forms, what Timothy Morton calls hyperobjects. When our very living and dwelling produces destructive waste, toxins, and carbon emissions that warm our planet. Pictured are massive waste lagoons from feedlots and large industrial cattle operations in Texas, which waft up dangerous hydrogen sulfide fumes and can contaminate groundwater and soil. It is a time when our throwing away, quote unquote, of plastic becomes a semantic fallacy as those voids shimmer into real places. It is a time when each corn muffin we might have for breakfast has something to do with a global bee extinction. So just as Heidegger asked to see our dwelling as a poetic relationship, he continually reckons with the fact that it requires our physicality on Earth. In our own lives, that means we must acknowledge that our very existence implicates over-tilling our soil, plants going extinct, and releasing toxins with each press of a spray nozzle on a bottle of garden pesticides. 
following, I share a series of sensory embodied and indeed poetic means of engaging with these ramifications and our own crisis of dwelling on earth in the face of ecological disaster. Dwelling must be a fluid language of relationships, orientations, rituals, and instincts wrought from that poetic eco-awareness. The first application of poetic dwelling to the Anthropocene has to do with the idea that dwelling is a collaboration with the earth around us. Heidegger differentiates between dwelling that is simply building or raising up of edifices and dwelling that acts as a type of cultivation of the land around it. That is, a type of dwelling that is of a nurturing and caring type, as a way of bringing forth things that grow by themselves. He is careful to be specific about the nature of this type of cultivation. It means to cherish and protect, to preserve and care for. It tends to the growth that ripens into fruit of its own accord. This is fundamentally framed as a collaboration with the environment that one dwells in, that we would sustain ourselves with plants that grow on their own. And we wouldn't only care for things that are grown for our own project of progress. That is, man would work to cultivate nature's existing ecosystems as opposed to anthropocentric methods of, say, industrial farming. Again, this is another image of toxic runoff from an industrial CAFO or cattle operation. As we sustain only plants and animals that we perceive as valuable, we alter the genetic makeup of biological life on Earth and change it in ways that explicitly damage and pollute the environment. Counting the entire food chain, primarily agricultural land use, accounts for a staggering 29% of all greenhouse gas emissions. The first way we can engage with Heidegger's poetic dwelling and his idea of cultivation is through ecologically responsible foraging, the use of plants that grow on their own. When we identify edible plants that grow by themselves, we increase our proximity to their own autonomous existence. We can search for wild fungi, taking only a third of what we find, and acknowledge the vast mycelium network to which it and much of life owes its existence. These are mushrooms that I foraged at the Shell House with artist collaborators and also in uh, nearby forests. I also collected wild thyme and clover in the backyard of the Shell House and responsibly procured some for use, instead of classifying it as an invasive species or seeking its eradication. I made the clover into iced tea that you see at the right. We eat these foraged non-humans as what could be considered an act of solidarity with our shared environment. Again, philosopher Timothy Morton speaks on this in his work. It is an attempt to acknowledge our reliance on such entities. Through sensory consumption or taste, we engage with entities that we coexist with. We consume a node in a vast network around us. After we foraged the mushrooms, we took the leftovers and cultured them to create mycelium, which we then returned to the forest. Poetics require these kinds of mutually beneficial relationships, a recognition of imperatives that can supersede our own prerogatives. This image shows us um, dumping the cultured mycelium onto a dead tree stump, where it can seed growth for more mushrooms the following year. We should seek to engage with a multi-species commons where we work with in mutually beneficial relationships. We identify our dwelling as shared by ourselves as well as by plants, animals, and microbes. Projects of cultivation should require the consideration of impacts beyond human objectives. How can we return nutrients to an ecosystem? A second part to consider in Heidegger's poetic dwelling is to explore our existence as a fundamental and poetic relationship with Earth. It is an invitation to strengthen the intimacy with the Earth that you occupy. But as the climate crisis unfolds, the urgency to, for people to care about the planet, while real, hides a deeper imperative. How can we care for a thing we don't notice? How can you pay attention to a glacier melting if you can't pay attention to how rain falls in your own backyard? 
Thus, strengthening our relationship with Earth has much to do with paying attention. When we pay attention to our yards, our parks, and our forests, patterns emerge that teach us about our place in the environment. We allow ourselves to develop a kind of place-specific knowledge about how our being and our minds have co-evolved and coexist in a particular realm. Giving deep attention to our immediate surroundings and spending time noticing details, listening to plants rustle, or seeing the change in the seasons, gives you intimacy with this earth and defines your existence as a mortal dwelling upon it. Once we notice how many bees are pollinating the clover in a field and how co-reliant on the clover with the bees we are if we harvest it for iced tea, we start to notice a larger narrative about interconnectedness. This is the clover that I harvested to make uh, iced tea. We can ask, how does our consumption impact other species? How do those species in turn pollinate and benefit our fields and farms? We notice the bees. And in the future, we may think to plant bee-friendly flowers. This is not in itself a realization that there is a global bee crisis, but it is a fundamental awareness of the bee's existence, and that creates ripples that accumulate significance. Similarly, the act of paying attention to an invasive species, quote unquote, in a new way has important ramifications. Above, I used mugwort found growing along the wall of the shell house dwelling in a dish of shakshuka. I learned something both about my immediate landscape and also how our language shapes our interactions with it. What we name a thing may define how we choose to engage with it. We often seek to remove all traces of invasive plants, but we covet, quote, wild edibles, and we ignore, quote, common plants. Cooking with forage plants brings a fuller awareness of our connection to a vast network of beings and places as their complexities intertwine. One plant or fungi has arisen here in our backyard due to warmer temperatures, the result of fossil fuels burning around the world, the same trajectory causing glaciers to melt and fields to wither at great distances from our own dwelling. We gain an understanding of the potential for what plant life looks like under different or changing climactic conditions. Eating these entities, as in this um, wood sorrel and risotto dish that I also made at the Shell House, becomes our most direct engagement with such seismic shifts in our climate. Taste is a means through which to access what is otherwise vast and unknowable. It is an avenue for intimacy. These moments of paying attention add up, and they will ground us more fully in what our experience of dwelling has to do with non-humans, with ecological and industrial systems, with our climate, and with scales of time and space beyond ourselves. Sustainable dwelling will also require new values and a new kind of socio-cultural ethics. Preserving the location in which you dwell, as Heidegger suggests, involves socially accepted assumptions and cultural norms about what preservation means. That includes stories, language, and allegories that dictate our actions. What are dwelling values that actually help create a more sustainable and poetic relationship with the planet? Cultural norms often unwittingly shape how we learn and expect to move through our environment and in turn what we value. Many of these assumptions we take for granted. We don't think of weeds or insects as food. Uh, above is pictured a mealworm toffee. We are also careless with water if our cultural norms permit it. As a quarter of humanity faces water shortages, will rainwater collection become a cultural tradition? Could we imagine that the act of collecting and preserving rainwater is such a valued act that we develop special ceremonies for it? or share it with our children and grandchildren? Or can we imagine families passing down recipes for distilling their own portable water? This image is of a desalination device I created using uh, green depression glassware and other objects that one might be given by a relative as they are taught the technique for creating precious drinking water. 
Our orientation towards our environment and the objects in it can be built of actions related to eco-aware, cultural, ethical, and moral imperatives. Perhaps we can imagine shifts in our own norms which will reflect new values. Maybe a new ritual around carefully washing and reusing plastic forks or egg cartons, or a reverence for objects that will help us alleviate our strains on the earth, compost bins, or pickling jars, as pictured above, may all take on greater cultural significance. Many of these cultural shifts will be a new normal to those who adopt them. Humans have difficulty in seeing change over long spans of time, resulting in a kind of generational amnesia. This leads us to accept our own values and assumptions as the static norm. And we have no reason to doubt future humans will experience the same kind of change blindness. They might have new cultural values oriented towards pickling or composting or preserving plastic that become entirely normal. We will adapt and create new notions of tradition. The last aspect of poetic dwelling that we can apply to the Anthropocene is the idea of entanglements. Poetics in language involves the entanglement of objects, ideas, and emotions to approach an understanding of something's nature in an indirect way. Our environment, too, contains entanglements and metaphors where close objects relate to large ideas like climate or industry through indirect relationships at elusive spans of space and time. These vast systems of interconnected actions can unravel into obscene results. Small actions contain within them powerful impacts. Opening a plastic container does, in a darkly poetic way, relate to the alteration of Earth's geologic record. Melted plastics found conjoined with beach sediment, basaltic lava fragments, and organic debris formed a new type of rock that was coined by an artist and science collaboration as a plastiglomerate. This is a new Anthropocene stone that will now be a layer in Earth's geologic record. In the project above, I intentionally melted down otherwise wasted household plastics with objects from the environment and other detritus. Eating industrially processed meat does relate to glaciers melting in Greenland, another hard-to-see entanglement. It relates to the disappearing of the idea of the Arctic. Every movement becomes an impression made with slow ripples out in space and time. Our bodies themselves become evidence of the long, loopy aftermaths. To dwell is to inhabit space, and as contemporary philosophers, post Heidegger, remind us, the space we inhabit isn't simply over there. As Sarah Ahmed says, bodies do not dwell in spaces that are exterior, but rather are shaped by their dwellings and take shape by dwelling. That is, the very movement of our bodies influ evidences the influence by and on the exterior world around us. Our actions take us outside of ourselves to reveal how our body is affected by and affecting its surroundings. Consuming food, using plastics, and even favoring the growing of one type of plant or food over another all reveal that our dwelling is, in fact, an expansive and participatory endeavor that have biological and geologic scope. This is not to demonize our actions, but to better understand their false delineations. There is no longer a clean line between man and nature. Our use of and interaction with objects in the world around us in order to live and dwell marks them as much as it marks us. We co-create reality with our environment. Heidegger emphasized an authenticity we should constantly seek in our project of dwelling. This requires we consciously find ourselves entangled with the world, acknowledging the trajectory that objects take to get to us and the path they take beyond us, even if it is hard to see. A messy heuristics of sensory engagements, tiny actions of noticing over and over again, and cultivating plants around us are all the beginning to the project of poetically dwelling on Earth. Thank you.